And by the way, this was asked by, to Imam Malik rahimahullah. Somebody came to Imam Malik rahimahullah and said, what if I, you know, is it okay for my wife to wait for me after I finish eating, then she eats? And he said, ذَلِكَ بِنْ ذَلِكَ فِعْلُ الْجَبَابِرَ This is the act of tyranny. We don't do this. Right? We protect the rights of our women. SubhanAllah. So this is the first essential problem. Popular discourse. And how it's been framed. How we've been made to look like something alien and something apart. And this is actually a part of selective amnesia. You know, we don't look at Islamic uh, world history, the two civilizations are very much connected. And this idea of, you know, this clash between two civilizations, and they have nothing in common whatsoever, this is absolute nonsense. Some of the greatest universities of the Christian and Jewish tradition were actually established in the Muslim world under Muslim rule. We don't know this because we don't know that part of history. We only know the part of history that the radio commentator or the newscaster wants to tell us. The part that will inflict or incite conflict, that's the part that they want to highlight. So this is the first part problem, popular discourse. How do we engage in that discourse? Here's the second problem. The second problem is our ignorance. The ignorance of the Muslims. You know, I was listening to a, a Baptist minister on the radio who's talking to other you know, Baptists, he's teaching them how to preach to Muslims. He's teaching them how to preach to Muslims. If you have a Muslim co-worker, if you have a Muslim business partner, if you have a Muslim student, etc., etc., how do you bring them to Christianity? He's training the people on the radio on how to talk to Muslims. And they have supposedly a Quran expert, a Christian Quran expert on the radio, going off explaining how they have to deal with Muslims, what they consider shirk and haram, and he knows all these terminologies. And he's talking about the Qur'an and it sounds like he knows what he's talking about and the reality is he's misquoting, misusing what the Qur'an says, completely off from the translation of the Qur'an. But you know what the sad thing is? The vast majority of even Muslims, if they are listening to this guy, they won't know the difference. They'll actually think that's in the Qur'an. What's the biggest weapon some of these people have? In, in, you know, in, in causing confusion and spreading lies about Islam itself, it is the ignorance of the Muslims themselves. We don't even know what Islam says, how are we going to tell somebody else? It's a, it, you know, it's a fair question to ask. If something's being misrepresented about Islam, these ministers, they know more places from the Qur'an to quote to you than you probably even read. And that's a serious problem. We don't know even what we stand for, what our civilization is, what our sacred text says. So this is the second problem. The first problem is popular discourse. The second problem is our own ignorance. But the third problem is the real problem. These two are minor issues. These can be solved. Education can be removed through, or ignorance can be removed through education. It's not impossible, right? Popular discourse can be changed once we start engaging ourselves. It can be changed. But the real problem, the real problem is the behavior of the Muslims. The behavior of the Muslims. That is the, the biggest obstacle to giving the message of Islam to anybody else. It's the biggest obstacle. Let me tell you why. You know how you ever, you ever heard the expression, actions speak louder than words? Right? So if somebody comes up to the Muslim and says, you people oppress women. You people oppress, your religion teaches you to oppress women. We say, no, we, no it doesn't. It actually protects the rights of women. Look at these ayat, look at these hadith, look at the practice of the Messenger How can you tell me that in a society where every two and a half minutes a rape takes place, you're telling us that we've abused the rights of women? Look at this incredible practice and honoring of women in society and how it completely transformed how the Arabs were. And you know the non-Muslim can point and say, look at the Muslim world, how many cases of spousal abuse? How many cases? How many cases of spousal abuse in this country? How many cases of spousal abuse, husbands abusing their wives, Muslims, in Urkic? How many cases in Jews? We ourselves, we ourselves are the ultimate anti barrel Our behavior. You know, the Muslims, we, we protect, our, our, our sacred text calls for honesty, dealing, in, dealing with people with truth. Ulu qawlan sadida fi surat al-ahzab, speak straight forward. Speak, you know, speak in an upright fashion. And yet, one of the worst business decisions you can make nowadays is become a business partner with another Muslim. Because it's, you know, you're going to get, basically, you're going to get, <laughs> you know, you know what's going to happen. And this is popular now. Oh, don't deal with those Muslims. You don't ever know what you're going to get. You know, they're going to swindle you, they're going to undercut you, and they're going to look all religious on the outside, but they will, you know, basically con you out of all your money. That's the popular impression. But how did it get to that point? Our own behavior. So our texts, our Quran and Sunnah are so beautiful, and our behavior is so ugly. It's so ugly 
But what do people see? People don't see the Quran and Sunnah. What do they see? They see us. They see our behavior. And when they see us, they're not going to care to look what their book says. They probably got all this from their book. That's what they assume. So they blame our religion based on our shortcomings. And you know what? As much as we complain about that, as much as we can say, no, don't judge Muslims, judge Islam, in the end, in the end, until Muslims change their behavior, until we represent what our book and the Quran and the Sunnah says, until then we can't really spread this message. We cannot really spread this message. Wallahi, I know brothers that took shahada, they, they accepted Islam by looking up Islam in the public library. But when they came to the masjid, they thanked Allah and said, Thank Allah, I did not meet these people first. Thank Allah, I learned Islam first. Because if I met these people first, I wouldn't even have learned about Islam. I would never even have considered it. How bigotous they are. How they look at you. The way they behave towards you. The way they fight with each other in the house of Allah. These kinds of things, you know, we are turning people away from the da'wah of Islam from our own behavior. From our own behavior. So here's the thing. The vast majority, the vast majority of Muslims, they're not doing da'wah at all. They're not doing da'wah at all. There are some Muslims, may Allah reward them and, and, and bless their efforts and put power in their efforts and barakah in their efforts that are trying to spread the message of Islam within the Muslims and even beyond the Muslims. But their work is being multiplied by zero by all the lack of practice and the corruption of the rest of the Muslims. Because whenever they speak, the actions of the rest of the Muslims speak louder than their words. Those actions are louder than these, the words of these Muslims. We're undoing our own efforts. We're undoing our own efforts. This is a serious problem. And this is the problem we have to resolve. You know, I want to give you, you've heard khutbahs about the importance of da'wah before. But I want to approach it from a different angle today, inshaAllah ta'ala, the long-term consequences of not being a nation of da'wah. When we are not a nation of spreading and inviting people to the message of Islam in speech and in practice. If we are not those people, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of that? Of course, the first consequence is that we become the people that might fall under the curse of Allah according to the book of Allah Himself. <laughs> those who hide with the, what we sent down from the book, those who hide it, they hide it, they keep it secret. Those are the people that, Allah, even after the book had come down and we had made it clear to people, those are the people that Allah curses and creation is only designed to curse them. Allah has designed special people whose only job is to curse those kinds of people. They're, they're assigned to that. That's the biggest consequence of not being a nation of da'wah in our speech and in our action. Right? That's the first consequence. But there are other consequences. Allah Azza wa Jal wipes out, by the way, move forward inshallah. There are a lot of people standing in the back and let's make space. Ta'ala, be courteous to the people around you. The consequences of this are beyond even, you know, that's in the next life, but there are consequences in this life too, in this life also. What we learn from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of Allah as far as dealing with all the works of all the messengers, and his dealing with previous nations, the ones that have received revelation, we learn basically two lessons. The Muslim Ummah, or the Ummah of believers, will, will face trials, they will face troubles. It's never going to be easy. It's always going to be trials. And these trials are there to guarantee us Jannah. I'm happy, but you know, Allah Azza wa Jal says in, in Surah Al Ankabut in the very beginning, and by the way, Surah Al Ankabut is the Surah of Da'wah. If you want to learn the, eth the ethics of Da'wah and the, the most important principles of Da'wah, you go to Surah Al Ankabut. It's one of the best places to learn about Da'wah in the Quran. In the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ahasibanna. People assume they're going to just say they believe they're not going to be tested. People, people will just assume they just have to become Muslim and just come to make salah and just go home and that's it. They have iman, they're not going to be tested. We thoroughly tested those who came before them also. These ayat came down when Khabbab bin Al-Arab paid a price for making da'wah to Islam. Not just accepting Islam, calling people to Islam. The Quraysh, they took this companion of the Prophet they took this companion, they put him on burning coal until his back, the, the skin on his back melted and was peeled off. And in this horrid state, he came to the Prophet and said, if we are the people of truth, why is this happening to us? Why do we, how, how can we deserve this if we are the people of the truth? 
And the, and the Messenger told him, you are rushing. There are people that came before you that were sawed in half, or buried into the ground alive, because of what, because of la ilaha illallah. So you're rushing to judgment. Don't rush to it. And then the ayat came down. Do you think you're just going to get Jannah just like that? Imagine what he went through and Allah said, that's not even that. You haven't really paid yet. We have to be mentally prepared for trials. When we engage in the work of da'wah, we have to be mentally prepared for trials. Now, in this surah, when Allah gave this passage about how to make da'wah and be patient and struggle, then He mentioned a number of prophets. I'm only going to mention the immediate two prophets that are mentioned right after. Immediately after this passage, Allah starts talking about Nuh alayhi salam. And immediately after that, He starts talking about Ibrahim alayhi salam. What's the significance of first talking about da'wah, then talking about Nuh alayhi salam, and then Ibrahim alayhi salam, immediately after that. You see Nuh alayhi salam, if you know nothing else, you know it's relentless da'wah. It's non-stop da'wah. It is consistent, untiring, unflinching calling to Islam for 950 years continuously. So this, what, what is this teaching us fundamentally? That this work is not something that can be done over a month or a year or a seminar. It's something that has to be a constant effort of the Muslim. This has to be a constant work of this Ummah. The constancy of Nuh is alluded to. Then Ibrahim and by the way, if you want to give an adjective to the da'wah of Ibrahim you would have to say fearless da'wah. Fearless da'wah. So there's constant da'wah Nuh and there's fearless da'wah Ibrahim and no matter what the consequences, he's not going to let go of la ilaha illallah. He's not going to let go of it. Our da'wah should not be based on fear. Our da'wah should not be based on anger, and it should not be based on fear. It should be neutral, like the da'wah, the calm, collected da'wah of Ibrahim a.s. He has the ability to talk to even some of the, one of the worst human beings in nice language. He, just in logical discourse, intellectual discourse, he's able to do that a.s. So we have to learn from these things. Now what I wanted to conclude with, inshaAllah ta'ala, is just some basic food for thought that all of us need to take a little more seriously if we are to engage in this work. If we are really serious about taking the work of da'wah forward in this country at, you know, at the level of a community and even as individuals. Sometimes, when you think about the problems of the Muslims, those problems are so big that you get overwhelmed. And when you get overwhelmed, you say, oh man, there's no solution. Man, we got so many problems, I don't even know when it's going to stop. Right? That's usually our attitude. And sometimes this becomes a casual, entertaining conversation over dinner. Man, we got so many problems. Our rulers are so corrupt. The media hates us. They send that and the other. We talk. We make a list of all the problems we have. It's like our, you know, the, the non-Muslims have Alcoholics Anonymous and their, you know, their therapy sessions. We have Jai Anonymous, right? We just sit over Jai and we discuss the problems of the Muslims and we don't do nothing about them, right? We say it's too big a problem for us to fix. Now how do we change that attitude? First of all, Allah Azza wa does not demand from me or you to change the whole world. What does He demand from us? To change ourselves. That's what He demands from us. In Allah لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم Allah knows, it is no doubt that Allah is not the one to change what is afflicting a nation until they change what is in their own selves. Right? Not even be him, be أنفسهم within their own selves at the individual level. What am I doing wrong? How am I misrepresenting Islam in the way I deal with my wife, with my neighbor, with my co-workers, with the people that drive by me on the highway? How am I misrepresenting Islam being a Muslim? You can change that much. Instead of complaining, complain about yourself. Start with that. The second thing I said, you know, the, the third, the biggest problem was our behavior. So let's start changing our behavior, right? The second problem above that was our ignorance. So we need to address that too. We need to become students of this deen. We need to start asking more and more questions. We need to start to learn more and more and more. We need to connect with people that know better than we do. So we can call them or email them or you know, visit them and learn from them. It's not necessary that you join a madrasa or you become a, you know, a, a muhaddith or a mufti, etc. to represent the basics of Islam. But it is important that you connect it with somebody who has knowledge. If you, if you at least have some contact with somebody who has knowledge, you, when, you, when something comes up, you can ask them, you can learn about it, right? And it, I prefer, my advice would be to have someone like that who's actually a living person, not someone behind the screen with a screen name and you have no idea what you're getting, what knowledge you're getting online, right? It may or may not be valid. So if you have a person like, you know, uh, the imams of our community, subhanAllah, they're a wonderful resource for that. We need to put them to work. 
We need to be going to them and asking them these sorts of questions. This is our second issue. As, as for the first concern, you know, this, this idea of Muslims being portrayed in the West, we need to be a little bit more, uh, a little stronger at the local level. Don't worry about what's happening in the United States, worry about what's happening in your town. We should have, the, the sisters should have a women's program at the public library, women, you know, women in Islam. Or the, the veil of the Muslim woman. It's one of the controversial topics. And invite the Muslim, non-Muslim women of the community and let the Muslim women speak to the non-Muslim women about what this, you know, what they stand for and how much confidence they have. You know when that girl, you may or may not have heard that girl who ran away from her house in Columbus, Ohio, she converted to Christianity and she accused her father of trying to kill her and all of that, which is all a lie. I met the father. That's all a lie. It's bogus. You know, and they weren't even a religious family. She was a cheerleader before she ran away. So what's he gonna, you know, he could have, have killed her for that, right? If, if anything, he's crazy. But he didn't. He didn't say anything. So this is all bogus. That, that's all bogus. But anyway, you know who the best people are to respond to that? Why are these Muslim, what about these Muslim girls that are being oppressed in their homes? The best people to respond are Muslim teenage girls themselves. Why don't they speak, write an article for the local paper, and say, what are you, what are you guys talking about? We have it better than anybody else. Right? We have to speak up. We have to represent this thing. We have to stand up and say, this. you can't say this about us. This is not who we are. And you know, we instead of constantly running after all the allegations they make against us and say, no, no, we're not this. We don't oppress women. We don't hate you. We don't, we don't want to kill everyone. We're not, we don't, we're not strapping any explosives when we go to the mall, etc., etc. Instead of constantly answering their allegations and constantly telling people what Islam is not, we need to start telling people what Islam is. They're constantly making us tell them what Islam is not. But this will not stop until we tell people what Islam is. We need to tell them. And instead of them criticizing us, if you learn something from the da'wah of the prophets, they look at the greatest evils of their society and they criticize those evils. They don't just talk about Iman in the Akhirah and just just the hate. No, 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 they go beyond that too. Lut alayhi salam says, you people are committing shamelessness. He goes after their shameless behavior. Shu'ayb alayhi salam goes after the corrupt business practices of his people. If there is a corruption in the society, who's supposed to stand for it? It is the Muslims. So what we need to be recognized as, if, if we were really doing da'wah, you know how people would see us? People would see us, these people don't care what happens to them, they stand up for justice. Anybody who is oppressed, the Muslims stand up, stand up for them. They're not a lobby for their own selves, they are a lobby for the people, for justice, for equal rights. And then whenever there's a violation, some, some, you know, somebody's integrity is being questioned, somebody's rights are being usurped, the Muslim stands up. And this is the sunnah of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look, I'll leave you with one example just to think about how we need to rethink how we take da'wah in this country. Just to rethink it. You know, there was a, um, I told you, Khabbab bin Arak. Before this, you know, even when you were little, you heard the story of Yasa radiallahu anhu, right? And his wife, and you know, his child, how they were executed basically for saying la ilaha illallah. When the Messenger saw this happen in front of his own eyes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Did he have a, you know, was there any sort of a protest? Any picket fence? Any yelling and screaming, stop the killing of the Muslims? Any standing in front of the United Nations and protesting and screaming at him? Nothing. What did he say to them? He said, have patience. Ispiru ya Yasser. Ya Ahla Yasser. Ya our family of Yasser, have sabr. Your place is Jannah. He told them to have sabr. When you are on this path, instead of complaining about the troubles that come to you, you have to have Patience. But in the same era, a mushrik, a non-Muslim, came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told them that Abu Jahl has taken my money and you won't give it back. He didn't tell him be patient. He didn't. To the Muslim he said, be patient. To the non-Muslim he grabbed him by the hand, took him to Abu Jahl and said you better give him his money back. SubhanAllah. So we are putting ourselves in sacrifice for the justice to be served for others, not for ourselves first, for others first. This is why Allah says, "Kuntum khayra ummatin ufrijat, not minan nas, but lin nas." You are the best of nations derived not from the people, but for the people. Allah says, "You are the best nation chosen, not from the people, but for the people." We are here to serve. What Allah's religion has to offer is a service to humanity. Allah came to remove the shackles of oppression that are oppressing the people around us. So
also our attitude needs to change. We have to become a little more confident. We, we have to stop being so defensive all the time. This, we're not this and we're not this and we're not that. Let's start learning what we are and sharing what we are with our friends and neighbors. First, and we, again, I reiterate and I'm done. None of this sharing of Islam will be of any benefit to anyone until we see a change in our behavior. <coughs> until we see a change in our attitude. May Allah Azza wa make us capable of changing our behavior. May Allah Azza wa make us better Muslims because of this blessed month of Ramadan. May Allah Azza wa keep us away from the evil things that we have left before this month started and make them make us abandon them for the rest of our lives. May Allah Azza wa make us truly capable of tawbah to Him. May Allah make us this make us an ummah that stands up for the message of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. May Allah Azza wa make us, our children, our families, burst first, very knowledgeable in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger and make them capable with confidence of sharing its message with friends and neighbors alike. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iya'kum bil ayat wa bikum. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa khususan ala afwadihim wa khatam al-Nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يكرم العدل والإحسان وإيتائه القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت